Hey, welcome back to Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Setacase. I'm a former theology student, current philosophy student, and uh, this is a podcast where I explore fascinating ideas uh, with experts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I really love thinking about cool stuff, and so you're invited to come think with me. Today, we have a very special guest. He's This is his third time on, uh, and that's Dr. Michael Humer, professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado Boulder. First time we talked about, like, all things philosophy. We went over his philosophy textbook. Uh, then we talked about uh, why you're probably not in a computer simulation or a brain in a vat. So if you guys are interested in those, go check those out. They're awesome episodes. But today we're going to be talking about the existence of the soul and reincarnation. Uh, we're going to be going over mostly over one of his papers, but he's got a couple papers on this super fascinating, amazing stuff. Before we jump in, I want to thank everyone who supported me on Patreon. If you want to, um, if you want to see this thing continue, then please can uh, consider becoming a Patreon patron. You can support me through the link in the description, wherever you're finding this on. Uh, if you're if you're listening to audio, if you're listening to the video, it's in the description. Uh, click that link to Patreon. You can find a bunch of different ways to give and a bunch of different like goodies uh, at, at different levels, stickers and mugs and uh, early access to these kind of videos, all that good stuff. Go check that out. A second way you can support this podcast is by checking out my sponsors, Biblios Clothing Company. Uh, they're an awesome clothing company. They got really cool designs. Uh, sent me some of the stuff, and I really like it. It's it's really cool. I I probably would um, still say that they're good if they weren't, but they actually are, so I don't have to lie to you guys, which is nice. So you can find um, the link to Biblios Clothing Company in the description as well. And if you use this link for a limited time, uh, it's my link, Biblios Clothing Company slash discount slash Parker. You can get 10% off your entire order. So order a bunch of stuff, use that code, and uh, get 10% off. You can support me by supporting them. That would be huge. All right. So uh, enough commodifying myself. Let's jump in with Dr. Humor, and uh, let's talk about souls and reincarnation. Dr. Right. Humor, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. Third yeah. time on. This is awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I uh, forgot that there were two others. Yeah, yo. I hope that didn't bring up like bad memories, and you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have come on after all. <laughs> no, no. I just, I just remember the last one, the Brain of Vat podcast. Yeah, that was that was super fun. Um, well, this one's this one's fantastic. You sent me this paper that you've been working on. Uh, Disembodied souls are people too. Um, where where can people find this when after they've um, listened and, and been interested? Yeah, so you know, this is this is like a paper in progress that. Um, so I was invited to contribute a chapter to a book edited by Stephen Hetherington, which I don't know how long it will take to come out. It'll probably be a couple of years because okay. you know, that's how academics are. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's called something like Extreme Philosophy, but the title might change, you know, <laughs> yeah. as happens. So okay. actually, you know, you, you can't find it anytime soon. Well, wow, this is huge. This is a, a Parker's Pensies exclusive. I love it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you got you got advance notice, you know. Yeah. I mean, I have a previous paper in news about reincarnation, so. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't I didn't know where that was from. Um cuz you sent me that one as well, but that that's in news. So people can find that one as well. Um I I I have a provocative statement from you. Uh it's like your your abstract of the paper. I just want to read that and we can jump in. Uh you say, "I believe that you were once a disembodied soul and you will be one and you will be one again after your death. Later, you will be embodied again and will experience another lifetime. Then another life after that and another one after that and so on forever. No one ever comes into or goes out of existence. Everyone who exists at any time exists at all times, going back infinitely into the past and going forward infinitely into the future. Persons merely become or cease to become embodied. And... Yeah. That is quite a statement. I, I love it. Um, yeah. it it's fantastic. How did you come up with this? Uh, How would you come up with this idea? Because I could see if you were uh, practicing like you know Eastern religion, maybe, or if you were uh, a Christian, you might be a, a substance dualist. Like, from yeah. where did you come up with this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, this is uh, yeah. So you know, this is surprising to people because I'm not a uh, religious philosopher. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like uh, mo most non-religious philosophers are physicalists or something like that. And, uh, oh, you know, but, um, well, you know, why, uh, how did I come to think that I have a soul? Well, the answer is that, um, you know, I'm just like, I'm just not that much influenced by other people and by peer pressure. <laughs> and, 
you know, and when I first heard the idea that um, the mind is physical, like my intuitive reaction is probably the intuitive reaction of most normal people, which is like, what are you talking about? That just like doesn't even that doesn't make sense. Like what? You know, I don't even know what you mean by physical anymore, because if there was anything that I would think was not physical, it would be a thought or, you know, yeah. they're saying that's physical. Then I don't I don't know what this means anymore. <laughs> but anyway, so like it just it just seems obvious that mental things aren't physical. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like um, how I how I came to think that um, a person could be reincarnated. This was a couple of years ago. Um, and actually what what prompted the line of thinking was reading Leonard Susskind's book, The Cosmic Landscape. Oh, wow. Although, although oddly, like the view in there, uh, if you think about it, turns out to be intention with with the theory about reincarnation. Okay, but th this is what I was thinking. So he was like, he was talking about the multiverse hypothesis mm -hmm. and sort of like making a, making a persuasive sounding case for it. Okay, there are many universes. And so then, you know, and then you start to think, oh, so that means that you know, like maybe there are infinitely many universes. So that means that there are other universes where there are things like me, yeah. when there are people who are arbitrarily similar to myself. And then, and you know, this is, this is something that Max Tegbark says, like he like, he likes to bring out the bizarre implications of the whole <laughs> So, right. you know, and like he tries to calculate how far out you have to go to find a duplicate of yourself or something like that. And then yeah. a duplicate of the entire earth and whatever. Okay. And then I start to wonder, so why am I not experiencing that person's life? So to speak. So, yeah. right. Because my thought is sort of, if there's a, person that is sufficiently similar to me, maybe it would be me. And mm -hmm. therefore, maybe I should be experiencing that life. Um, okay, but I'm not. So this is actually, this, this is either some evidence against the multiverse theory that I'm not experiencing multiple lives, or, you know, some evidence against this, this view about persons, right? Yeah. Um, well, right, but anyway, but okay, but I think about that, I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. But what, what about this? You don't need a multiverse because our own universe has infinite time. So in infinite time, there's going to be another repetition of something like you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh, and you have a whole reason for why we don't experience those memories. Like, why don't I, when I was back in ancient Egypt or whenever, like, why don't I have those memories? And you, and you have a, a whole fleshed out uh, theory for that. I, I wanted to get in really quick uh, to like why I think that the mind uh is is non-physical you, you said you, you went over some seemings maybe you could go over like uh you know a phenomenal uh conservatives uh, approach to that but you give some reasons in the paper you give uh, three reasons um mental states have qualia mental states have intentionality and then at least some minds have free will can you can you flesh out the first one like why would having qualia be evidence for uh the non-materiality of the the mind yeah, so, you know, qualia, according to um, Thomas Nagel, are what it's like to have some experience. Um, as, as he described it, he says, um, the fact that an organism is conscious means that there is something it is like to be that organism. Mm -hmm. You know, as contrasted with, like, there's nothing that it's like to be this table, or uh, <laughs> nothing that it's like to be a tree, even. Um, and, you know, when you think about it, like, well, how can that be a physical property, right? And there's, you know, there's this famous thought experiment by uh, Frank Jackson, right, where there's like a person who has never seen color and they're in a completely black and white environment. And then, you know, and this person learns all about brain physiology and they all learn. Yeah. She learns about um, what happens in the brain when a person sees a blue object and what neurons fire and whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then the person leaves the room and for the first time looks at the sky. And does the person learn something new at that time? Mm -hmm. And it seems like, well, at that point, the person could learn what it's like to see blue. And it just seems like there's no way that you know what it's like to see blue just from studying the brain. Yeah. I mean, like learning all the physical facts about what the brain does. So it seems like that's not a physical fact. Yeah. So there's irreducible uh, quality of facts that... We can't see from the, the third person perspective, but that we all have from the first person. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I like that. I think that's right. But what, what do you make of like, you know, some physicalists say, well, uh, Mary, 
Mary's the the person who was locked in there. Mary gained a new concept. It wasn't it wasn't new language, but now she just gained a new ability to attribute you know this this qualitative blue to all the physical facts that she had about blues and skies. What, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, so uh, it's true that she gained a new concept. <laughs> she gained a yeah. concept of that particular qual. Okay, but it's also true that she gained new information, mm. right? So because like her previous information was compatible with um, the experience not having that qual, right? Yeah. Like, you know, just, just think about hypotheses about how it could be, what it could be like to see blue. There are different things that it could have been like, and she couldn't have ruled any of those out. Now, so it's true that she also didn't have the concept for entertaining those. Right? Yeah. But yeah. the, you know, relevant, interesting part is even if she'd had the concept, she wouldn't have known. Yeah. Right. Which, which one was the actual way that it's like to see blue? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I also like Tom Nagel's article, what is it like to be a bat, you know, which, okay, you know, I'll, I'll already referred to, but because, you know, he makes this point about how, um, you know, how it works when somebody reduces something to something else. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, you figure out that heat is actually the kinetic energy of these uh, molecules that are in rapid random motion. Yeah. Um, and um, there's a particular way that heat feels. And when you explain what heat really is, you do not have to explain the particular way that it feels. Because you can just say, well, that's just the effect on human observers of the physical, the real phenomena. The real phenomenon is these molecules moving around. Mm -hmm. And then the sensation that you have is just the effect that that has on your mind. Okay, so then you don't have to explain that part. So then, good. Okay, but now if you're trying to explain qualia and you say, okay, so qualia is really, you know, this brain state, whatever, you know, the, the qual of seeing blue is really this brain state. You can't say, well, now I don't have to explain what it feels like because that's just an effect on the mind of human observers. Yeah. I can't say that because that effect on the mind of human observers is exactly the target phenomenon. Right. To be explaining. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, it's irreducible. Yeah. It doesn't, if you reduce it away, you're not talking about the same thing anymore. You're not talking about the, I would say the quale, but, but maybe qual is, is the right way. Oh the yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Oh. Well, um, okay, so you, you brought up Nagel and uh, his, you know, super famous paper now. I just wonder really quick if you think that if bats, do, do bats have an immaterial soul since there is something that's like to be a bat? Yeah, I, I assume. I assume so. Okay. I assume that the bat has, an, has experiences. And, you know, I say assume because well, we don't know any of these things for certain. Oh, yeah. Right there. Sure, they could be like uh, I think Descartes said they were like automata and stuff, right? So like maybe maybe they are philosophical zombie, zombies or something. Right, yeah, but yeah, it doesn't I seem mean, like, you know, like seems seems improbable. Right? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but and, you know, by the way, like I don't know, like for all I know, maybe you're an automata. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. That's possible, but highly unlikely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So so we have um, the the qualia argument, which I think is great too, because. Uh, Jackson himself, I believe, is a physicalist and then like backed away from his Mary argument because it was too strong. Like it, it led to this this dualism type stuff, which I think is fantastic yeah. when you have an argument too powerful for your own theory. Yeah, I yeah, I was disappointed when I learned that he converted to physicalism or something like that. And I didn't I didn't really get why. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to speculate on that, but uh, I, mean, I do, but I won't. Um, okay, so so two, uh, mental states have intentionality. So so what work is intentionality doing to motivate dualism? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just another weird property of the mind that doesn't seem physical, right? The property of being about something, mm -hmm. right? So you know, my my example was um, I'm imagining a dragon. <laughs> yeah. Um, there aren't any dragons in reality, but this thought is about dragons, even though there aren't any. Yeah. All right. And then it's just kind of hard to understand how that's a physical property, like being about a non-existent thing is a physical property. I mean, even being about a real physical thing is also is also hard to understand. Like, it doesn't seem like physical states are about anything. Yeah. You know, I say in fairness, there are physicalist theories of intentionality. I just don't think that they, um, I don't think that they plausibly capture the phenomenon right yeah so like i hear the physicalist theory and i always go yeah but that's not sufficient for it to actually refer to anything yeah 
um, I, I think I think Dretsky has like he goes in for like information theory and says like there's information and everything and, and information is about stuff. So then like maybe maybe this rock is about something because it's encoded information that it's like it's gray yeah. or something. Yeah. What, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you know, like the, this no, the notion of information like this state of affairs carries information about something else. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think his notion is just um, like, in order for that to be the case, there just has to be like this law like connection, whereby the two states co vary. Yeah. And I just think, no, that's not sufficient for one thing to be about another, right? Yeah. Like, um, you know, okay, so you put like a thermometer in your, um, in your soup, and uh, <laughs> the thermometer carries information about the soup. So and that sounds true. But here's mm -hmm. another thing. The soup carries information about the thermometer. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. And then also, by the way, the left half of the soup carries information about the right half, <laughs> right? Because they're in equilibrium with each other. That's right. Um, but <laughs> that, you know, that is not sufficient. I mean, like the left half of the soup is not about the right half <laughs> or anything. Yeah, that's a great point. I think I think Searle makes that point about like observer uh, relativity uh, or uh, information that is it's, it's relative to an observer yeah maybe it is observer independence and and uh, relativity that like a, a tree if you cut it in half you can see the rings and the rings like tell you about how old the tree is but that is like it's relative to an interpreter interpreting that and like you said you the rings could be about the tree but the tree could be about the rings and there's like this it, it all depends on how you're picking out that information i think yeah i mean like i think it sounds plausible to say this thing carries information because we, when we observed it, we would actually have an intentional state in our mind. Right, right. right, right. Now, of course, this is not what Dretsky, this is not Dretsky's theory, right? Like his theory is not supposed to depend on there being an observer, right? Yeah. But yeah. I think it's sort of like the plausibility of saying that that's information sort of unconsciously depends on our knowing that when we saw it, we would have the intentional state. Yeah. Right? That's good. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, just one more thing on this. What what about uh, what about like propositions? Um, may, maybe you. I actually don't know what you think about propositions, but if if they are uh, abstract objects, it seems like they're about things. They have intentionality, but they're not. I mean, I would want to say maybe they're mental states in in the mind of God or something. But uh, what, what do you make of 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 propositions? Do you think they are abstract no. objects? Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I I just normally treat them as abstract objects, mm -hmm. but I haven't thought that much about whether I should be thinking this right. Um, like, there's an abstract object. Maybe it's like a possible state of affairs. Uh -huh. I know there are like you know there are ways of talking about propositions that don't sound like you know really the way you talk about a possible state of affairs, but you know maybe that's just like a superficial linguistic phenomenon. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay, so um, so we got intentionality, and at least uh, insofar as we have mental states, mental states do have intentionality, and so that's a reason. S since physical things don't seem like they're about things, it seems like we have a non phys we we are or have a non physical mind in order to have the intentionality that thoughts have. Does that sound right? Yeah, that okay. sounds right. Yeah, <laughs> we're in agreement. Yeah. Awesome. I love the uh, the imagining dragons thing. I, I think that was like intentional, right? That was like because there's a band, Imagine Dragons. Oh, I I, no, I don't know about okay, that. Okay, so it <laughs> nice. All right. All right, great. Um, okay, and then this last one, uh, this last one is interesting. So at least some minds have free will, and um, I've heard this one a lot. Being in in Christian circles, uh, a lot of there's this internal debate. In, in Christian circles between Calvinism and Arminianism and Arminians hold to libertarian free will. And a lot of Calvinists don't, most Calvinists don't. So I've heard this one a lot. Um, yeah. And they always mean, they say free will, but they mean libertarian free will. So I wanted to get your take on that is, does this uh, condition, like, does it necessitate libertarian free will or can you, can you hold a, just a non-physicalist compatibilist uh, view of free will? Oh, um, I mean, so if you have a compatibilist view of free will, like, um, it is easier to reconcile with physicalism. Yeah. Right. So I think on a compatibilist view, it's not a separate problem, you know, separate from the intentionality in qualia. Okay. Right? Like if you could explain those, then you can have compatibilist free will. Okay. 
right? Like, but you know, obviously you do have to have intentionality because you have to have intentions and desires and whatever, right? And reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So I do have a libertarian view about free will. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I mean, it's not, it's not just that determinism is problematic. It's physicalism is problematic for yeah. that. Yeah. Because it's sort of like, you know, even if you introduce indeterminism, um, it's still hard to see how you have freedom, right? So, yeah, like, given that all of our actions are, um, so there's just a physical object, you think there's just a physical object. And so I'm entirely made of atoms. And so everything that I do, it would seem is determined by the behavior of the atoms that I'm made of. Right. And, you know, and not the other way around, right? That is, the causation goes from the things the atoms are doing to what I'm doing and yeah. not downward from the macroscopic to the microscopic. Yeah. Okay. So then if you think that it's hard to see how I have free will, the atoms don't have alternatives, or if they do have alternatives, they only select randomly among them per quantum mechanics. Right. And so, yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I love this point so much. Um, one, one of my uh, professors and friends, Brandon Rickabaugh has, has developed this argument. Um, he call, I think he calls it mental drainage, uh, where, you know, if, if you have this physical cause and this mental cause for your uh, mental state, then there's overdetermination and it, uh, it all, it all drains down to the physical. And then just like you said, it seems like this is all reducible to the atoms moving in your head rather than like the intentional the in intentions or reasons, responsiveness of the agent, uh, which, I mean, that's awesome. I love that. So <laughs> I think that's fantastic. How, this seems to me like, so this is in, in Christian circles, we call this the argument from reason. And uh, it's, it's, it's against physicalism, sometimes against determinism based on how you cash it out. But so that's really, uh, if you're a Christian, I'd be like, yeah, okay, this is like basic argument from reason type stuff. But you're, you're not. And you yeah. have this argument, like, where did you discover this argument? Like, did, how do you have this argument? Yeah, we are. yeah. Why? Why do I? Why do I believe this without being a Christian? I don't know because <laughs> I just thought about it. It's like, I mean, you know, so, like sometimes I, um, you know, like Christian philosophers and philosophy students often like my work. Yeah, and you know, I I think about why that's the case, and I think they're, you know, even though I'm not one, and like I, you know, not theist really. Right. Um, but, you know, the, I think the reason is that um, I have common sense and neither I nor the Christians have been overwhelmed by certain ideologies in our age. Yeah. Right. So like part of part of what the Christian thinkers are saying is just sort of like common sense stuff that's been rejected because of a, another ideology. Yeah. Right? Like the ideology of scientism or something like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Christians have resisted it because they have their own ideology. Right. And I resisted it because I just don't care about social pressure. <laughs> so, um, well, right. But, awesome. you know, I mean, like, this is an intuitive thing to think, you know, like that you have a mind and that 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 explains your behavior, you know, in a way that's not just a bunch of particles bumping into each other. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I totally agree. Yeah, I think you're right on, on all accounts there. Um, well, so so with these three in hand, we got mental states have qualia, mental states have intentionality, and then at least some people or some some minds have free will. Now it, it leads us to to dualism, and you have a couple choices. You got property and substance dualism. Um, why go in for full blown substance dualism, what whatever kind that that you take, instead of just uh, opting for property dualism? Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I used to think property dualism was a better view because I guess because it's more moderate or something. Yeah, but, right. Um, and, you know, I guess it seemed less weird or <laughs> something like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, one thing is when you think about the problem of personal identity, um, substance dualism gives you an answer to that. Yeah. Like, it gives you a possible theory of personal identity. And the property dualist really doesn't help you with it. And uh, actually, it's a super hard problem for which I think the like there's no other intuitive answer. Right? So, like, so the intuitive answer for the substance dualist is, you know, you have the same person if you have the same soul, mm -hmm. right? Right? You know, there's like a, there's a particular, you know, to say what this means without using the word soul, there's a particular non-physical component of the person that determines their identity, 
Yeah. So there's, there's a part of you that's not a physical part. And if that thing remains, or if it is in, you know, a, a certain body, then that thing is you. Yeah. And, and so like, just going with the ship of Theseus, because we, we've talked about that on the podcast over and over. Uh, if the ship of Theseus had like a soul, if it was a living thing, whatever, just go with me. If it had a soul, then it uh, d- didn't matter how many of its uh, boards were sloughed off and, and uh, you know, reconstituted over here. Where's the real ship of Theseus? Wherever the soul uh, of that ship is. Is that something yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Right. See, and, you know, f- the fact that ships don't have souls is why, you know, there is perhaps no objective answer. Uh, the yeah. ship of Theseus problem, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, um, actually, some people, and and maybe myself included. So, can you just lay out really quick property dualism versus uh, substance dualism? Yeah. So, you know, this property dualism. There's like, um, there's like a famous chapter from P.F. Strawson, right? That talks about this. That says, well, you know, um. It's not that there are two objects. It's that there's a single thing called the person, which has two kinds of properties, mental properties and physical properties, right? And like, you know, he makes a big deal about how you shouldn't say that it's a different thing having these properties. Yeah. Um, and uh, and like if in a broadly naturalistic worldview, this sounds more plausible because, you know, like now I don't have to explain where the the mind or the soul came from. Right. Uh, and then, you, you know, you say, well, like, there's just this object that you see right here and maybe it has some emergent properties. Yeah. Right. So like maybe when you get certain complicated combinations of particles, then they generate new properties, but, but you know, where are those properties going to be located? They're just going to be properties of the, of the physical system. Yeah. Right. So that sounds okay. sounds okay until you start thinking about personal identity and like what is going to make something count as the same person or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the emergent stuff's interesting to me because I, I like it. It does sound like a mediating thing, but um, some people have pushed back and said, well, this seems like it's a, it's a wholly unique thing. Like you talk about water and that, you know, the wetness of water being an emergent property, but it's still just the result of its constituent parts. Whereas on this emergent theory, like there's a whole new uh, quality that's emerging, which is we don't find anywhere else in nature. Uh, yeah. What do you, what do you think of the emergent proposal? Like it, does it have anything to it or is this a, a insuperable yeah. like difficulty? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, this is like, I think this is a reasonable thing to think, right? <laughs> like, um, okay. There are no other cases that I know of, of emergent of like interestingly emergent properties, like right. emergent in an interesting sense. Um, you know, frequently, so when people are talking about this, um, they give some like really weak characterization of emergent properties, which makes it kind of trivial. So like pointillism like, oh, or something? What? Like pointillism in, in art or something like that? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, you know, like s- suppose you say, oh, so an emergent property is just a property that the whole has that none of the parts have. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, so then the existence of emergent properties is trivial. Okay. So like, um, you know, the property of being a cup is emergent because the parts of this cup are not cups. Yeah. So you're like, okay. Huh. But uh, you want to say something stronger than that. And, you know, roughly speaking, it's something like, you know, um, there's a property of the whole that couldn't have been predicted, right? Or would not have been expected solely by looking at the parts and the way that they're arranged. Yeah. There's like, you need some new law that comes into play when a certain complex configuration occurs Mm -hmm. right so you can't just like apply the laws that were um apply the laws that were instantiated when looking at simpler combinations right right like you need special laws for these complicated combinations in order to um to predict these new properties Mm -hmm. all right so that is controversial whether there is any any anything that's emergent in that sense yeah and as far as i know like i know of exactly one candidate which is you know mental states that's the only thing i know that might be emergent in that sense yeah right. yeah so so that that's mm, well since since you say that that dualism is a, a better case uh for identity over time then uh, look, maybe maybe there are emergent things. Maybe this is true. There are emergent laws and emergent, 
but we got a, a better theory in substance, full blown substance dualism. Does that does that seem like you're uh, what you're saying here? Uh, I guess I mean, um, you know, I was just just thinking like, is is emergentism still true? Right? Like, um, I mean, we you know we need some kind of special laws to explain how the mind and the body interact with each other. Yeah. So maybe those will count as emergent laws, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I, um, I was talking to to Jonathan Schaffer about this because he's got this uh, ground functionalism theory that he's working with where he, he wants to say there's this mind making principle and it's, it's not just merely uh, nomological and it's not like the, the analytic uh, type that like uh, David Lewis would go in for or, or something like that or Armstrong, but it's, it's a metaphysical law. It's a metaphysical uh, mind making principle so that it, it, well, he's a functionalist or he's, he's arguing for functionalism. So it doesn't seem like it would be an emergent property. It would just be like a metaphysical or emergent law. It's just a metaphysical law that once you get these things set, then a mind is, is made. Yeah. I mean, see, like I, I think I need to actually read Schaffer in order, oh, yeah. in order to comment <laughs> on it. Um, <laughs> That's good. But I mean, I guess I would say like, so there's, you have to have some kind of like, you know, bridge principles between the physical and the mental, like, oh, yep. when this happens to your brain, then this happens to your mind. Why? So I would take it that it's uh, it's just a law of nature. There's some yeah. complicated laws of nature, maybe. Or maybe okay. they're simple. I don't know. Anyway, there's some laws of nature that connect physical to mental states. Um, and I, so I would think that it's metaphysically contingent, but nomologically necessary. Okay. I would think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would... Uh, so there's maybe like a, you know, maybe there's a possible position where it's metaphysically necessary too, even though it's not logically necessary, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I would have to think about why why you might think that. Yeah, and I, I hear that. And metaphysical necessity is a tricky one for me because it usually it's like conceivability arguments that we're using to to generate those. And then someone along someone comes along with a different uh well, I don't conceive that. You're like, dang, well. <laughs> okay we have competing intuitions here well yeah uh i mean well somebody claims to not be able to conceive what you just described then you think well let's see was i unclear did i not describe it <laughs> then you know sometimes i suspect that no they're just like taking they're just applying their theory you know and their theory right. says that this is impossible so they're gonna say no you, i can't conceive it right uh, I'm glad that you said that. I, I think you're able to say that, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is good. Um, okay, so um, we got personal identity. That's like a, a really big one for you that, that you're using in this paper. Uh, and physicalist theories, they're going to violate um, at least one of these. You, you give three uh, self-evident principles that you, you, you say they're self-evident. Um, and a physicalist theory is going to violate one of these when it comes to personal identity. And that's either facts about personal identity are objective or two identity is a one-to-one -one relation or three personal identity is intrinsic. So I thought maybe we could just go over what those are and then uh, you could say why you think that uh, physicalism violates those one, one yeah. of those three. Yeah. And I mean, as a matter of fact, I, as far as I know, every theory, but one, <laughs> oh, oh, actually, wait, no, I should say there are two possible theories that don't violate one of these. <laughs> okay. But one of them, as far as I know, is held by no one, <laughs> right? So yeah. So the other theory is that you're like a physical particle, well, an indivisible physical particle, <laughs> like a muriological yeah. simple or something. Yeah. Right. Like okay. you know, maybe there's a particular quark in your brain that's really oh, you. <laughs> I've heard that. I've actually heard that. I've heard. Yeah. I've heard that. That's wild. Um. And, you know, like my former colleague David Barnett suggested this to me, but I. I wasn't sure how serious he was. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, okay. And so, all right, so that's one theory, but let's ignore that. And then yeah. the other theory is, well, there's a non-physical simple part of you, which is your mind or your soul or whatever. Yeah. Okay. And then all other theories, I think, have have a problem where, you know, they're going to be extremely counterintuitive, right? Mm -hmm. all right. So, um, yeah, so three three principles about personal identity that you're going to, you're going to violate one of them, uh, objectivity of, of identity. So this is the idea that, well, there's an objective fact about whether something is me or in any, in any possible circumstance, 
um, there's an objective fact that I exist or that I don't exist. Mm -hmm. And like, it's not a matter of convention. It's, it's never just like a matter of how you choose to speak, whether I exist or not. Yeah. All right. And then the, the second, and so that's just supposed to be intuitive. And by the light, and you know, if you don't like that, then start thinking about what the implications are. Uh, if you, if you don't agree, if you think it could sometimes not be objective or it could be a matter of convention or something like, oh, uh, so there could be a situation in which like, I have a really strong reason for trying to change the way people talk so that I can survive. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, you know, maybe I'll try to convince, you know, there's some baby that's going to be born uh, on the day that I die. Maybe I'll just like try to convince a bunch of people to start calling that thing Mike humor. <laughs> right. And, and if, if, if identity is a matter of convention, maybe that will make that baby be me and then right. I won't have to die. Yeah. Um, okay. Now the, you know, people who think that it might be partly conventional would perhaps say, no, you can't like, you can't just make anything be you. Yeah. <laughs> but there are some things like it has to already be a reasonable candidate for you. Yeah. Okay. But so suppose that in other respects, this baby is a reasonable candidate for me. Okay. <laughs> right. It's um, and then you think about the idea that I have a really strong reason for trying to convince people to call that thing my humor mm -hmm. because that's going to make me survive. Yeah. Like that's not true. Right. Right. Um, what if it was your clone, a clone baby of my humor? Yeah. Yeah. So like, well, it's being the clone might make it sort of like a, a sufficiently close candidate that maybe the convention could determine whether it's me or not. Right. right. But, but you'd want to say like, but obviously it's not you. Um, you know, well, if, okay, if the clone um, is created before I die and we're both conscious at the same time and we say we're not the other person, then it's not me. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, if, it, if, if it's created shortly after I die, then, you know, you can't prove that it's not me. Oh, I, I just mean like, yeah, that's a, it seems like an absurd conclusion to, to, for all the rest of us to assume this perspective and say, well, yeah, that's my humor. Yeah. Oh, well, um, you know, you, you might have, I don't know, there might be cases where you would call them, you would do that, but, um, you know, um, like maybe they can sort of like, uh, collect information from my brain and they can sort of somehow impart that information into the clone's brain. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And then people start feeling more like it's me. And then there's a question about whether it's me or it's just like a copy of me. Okay. And then mm -hmm. you'll consider the, the possible view that this is, there's no objective matter of fact, and therefore it's just a matter of convention. And so, you know, we can, if we just start calling it me, then it's me. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, I want you to have the intuit, the intuition that no, <laughs> right. Right? Like, right. I can't make it be me by convincing people to call it me. Yeah. I, I was worried that you weren't going to say that final part there. I was like, well, you're, you're motivating this a little bit too much for me here, man. You're, you're messing with everything, but then you, you, you finish it off. Okay. Yeah. So conventionalism's no good. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So say, second principle identity is a one-to-one -one relation. Mm -hmm. That is um, only one thing can be you. There can't be two distinct things that are both continuers of you. Yeah. Um, and you know, this, this implies transitivity of identity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, okay. So, and why this is operative is that, you know, you have things like the fission case where it's like, you know, you imagine that there's a person who divides like an amoeba. Yeah. So, you know, the Which way I, amoebas... I think some twins do this, right? In the, in utero. Uh, if you're identical twins, I think they might fission off from the same... Oh, uh, like from the initial cell? Yeah. Yeah, there was a single egg cell, and then it split into two people. Yeah. Although I think it, uh, well, I guess it would be under debate whether it was a person at the time that split. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, but yeah. I, I would have said it was a pre-person, but. Um, oh, wait, but if it's a, uh, we're jump, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but if it's a pre-existent soul, we're just two, two pre-existent souls, we're just both present in the same same uh, zygote or something? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we don't know. I don't know when the soul enters the body. So okay. Okay. All right. Maybe it entered after the split. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Anyway, so you know, you imagine there's a person who could divide like an amoeba because that's how they reproduce. You know, mm -hmm. the cell. Did, okay. So <laughs> a person does that, and then are the two uh, 
you know, they call them like the two daughter cells or the daughter amoebas. Anyway, the two daughter U's, are they both you? <laughs> okay, and I want to say, no, they are not because only one thing can be you. Yeah. Right? So th as they're not identical to each other, so they can't both be identical to you. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So, okay. I'm going to see if I can motivate or if I can, uh, I'm going to see if I can pose an argument here. So if I'm, I don't know if I want to say daughter me's though. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, if, the, the, if I, if I engage in fission, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, you know, Parker A and B or something. Oh man. Um, and I'm just, it's just the rest of the universe, whatever. God puts me in a different universe or an evil demon. And it's just both of us. And then we're like revolving around each other. <laughs> you know like yeah, does that like mess with anything blocks. yeah because yeah. <laughs> that does that do anything here or no uh so mess with because now we got you the indiscernibility of of identicals right yeah yeah so or, if you have a yeah. uh, relational conception of space then maybe there's no difference between the two copies of you <laughs> okay and then there could be a question whether they're really the same okay person but but, um, but but each one is still gonna think that they're because now it's it's me and they if if they do have a personal conception or they're conscious, each one's going to think, well, no, I'm not him. Right. Oh, so, um, you know, let's assume that, you know, the, the two copies of you are in the, a normal world. <laughs> so, okay. so they're definitely not the same because they're like in different places and whatever. Right. Different, having different experiences. Okay. You ask them, Hey, are you having that person's experience and assume that they both say, no, I have no idea what that other guy is thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. So then, <laughs> You, know, you conclude so these are two different people okay and then you're like hey which one of you is the original parker yeah right? and they both say i'm the original <laughs> yeah because they both have the memories of the original mm -hmm. okay but i want to say well they can't both in fact be the original person because they're not identical to each other yep and by transitivity of identity if they're both identical to the original parker then they're identical to each other right Oh, okay, but do you just say that this is not possible? Because if that were possible, it seems like both have this legitimate claim to being the Parker. Or, or would you say at the point of fusion, the original Parker was destroyed or ceased to be? Uh, that might be, yeah. Okay. The, the point of fission. Fusion is joining, so fission. Oh, is sorry. Fusion. I thought, yeah, yeah. Fission, uh, fission. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, there's okay, there's three possibilities. It could be Parker A is the original one. It could be Parker B is the original one. Or it could be neither is the original. Yeah. In which case, you know, you died. So yeah. you should hope that you don't split. Yeah. Um, okay, how do you, you know, determine that? Yeah. How, how, any, any idea? Because now you brought I mean, up this problem again. Of like yeah. Theseus I mean, if this actually happens, we won't know. We'll have no way. <laughs> okay. Um, but I don't think this will ever happen. So don't worry. Okay. That's um, good. There was, there was a nice Star Trek episode. Uh, I think it was D Deep Space Nine in which, you know, they found out that Commander Riker got duplicated by a transporter malfunction. Mm -hmm. So then there's two copies who subsequently they start calling Will Riker and Thomas Riker. So it's okay. to not confuse them with each other. But both of them have the memories of the original. And then Wasn't they start... one left on the planet or something like that? An That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They tried to beam him up and like unbeknownst to the ship, a copy of him was left behind on the planet. Yeah. Super sad. Well, in, in that transporter theory, or um, not theory, but situation, man, if you if you don't have a soul, then that's like a pretty, it seems like a really gruesome thing. That you're like destroying this person and reconstituting a different person each time they're doing that. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you don't have a soul, then I don't know what, you, what your theory of personal identity is. So, you, you know, <laughs> so then we have to like query what the, uh, what the alternative theory is and see whether it counts as the same person, right? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't totally understand what's supposed to happen with the transporter if they like actually move the physical particles or the physical particles get beamed down. I think it's supposed to be the information. I, I looked this up recently. I think it's yeah. supposed to be they're like, yeah, they can press down all your information and they just transport that and new, uh, yeah, new physical um, BBs or whatever. Yeah, do I mean, we... like where where do the actual um, atoms that the person on the surface of the planet is made of come from? Like, like they beam yeah. you from the ship to the planet. Where do the yeah. atoms come from? So do they use yeah. the atoms that are already on the planet? Because I think that might make a difference to whether it's the same person. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. So if they use new matter, then that means it's possible to do it without destroying the original. So then there could be two copies. Right. Right. They can't both be the same person. 
and the one who stays behind is clearly the same person, right? So okay. then the one who goes down to the planet surface is not. Yeah. So in that case, it's, it's just yeah. copying. Not it's not actual uh, fission, right? It's just that's just making a copy or duplicate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, like um, unless like each of your atoms divides in two, which they can't because of conservation of matter, right? Yeah. When when an actual amoeba divides, you know, each of the offspring is half the size. Oh, I didn't know that. That yeah. makes sense. You know, yeah. Like, I, yeah. I never thought about it like that. It's just it's totally not creating, split. It's not creating new matter, right? <laughs> like yeah. conservation of mass. So, yeah. uh, and then it grows by eating or whatever. Sure. Um, it splits again. Okay. Uh, anyway, so like that's what would have to, have to happen to you. You know, like half of your brain cells would have to go one way and half the other way. Oh, yeah. But yeah. conceivably, it could still it could still be that they both have the memories of the original. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, so um, so identity is one to one relation, and then uh, personal identity is intrinsic. But what do we make yeah. of this? Yeah, and you know my my thought there is like um, whether something counts as you depends upon that thing, its nature and its relation to whatever your past self. Um, it doesn't depend upon some completely separate object. Hmm. Right. So like, there's a say that there are two things or I don't know, there are two person stages, right? And, you know, I won't say two persons because they might be stages of the same person. It will be yeah. controversial whether they're stages of the same person. Okay, but there are two person stages and they each have a certain intrinsic nature and they have a certain relation to each other. And whether this one is a stage of the same person as this one cannot depend upon something happening in a separate place, some other object. Yeah. Right. Where like if you kill this other object, then this one becomes the same as this. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, how about like uh, how about like parents like that seems like an extrinsic uh, factor in my personal identity, because I, I don't know. People always say, like, what what's a good case when I ask what's a good case of metaphysical necessity? People will say, oh, like you can't have different parents because you wouldn't be you if you had different parents. So metaphysically, like it's necessary that you had the same parents that you have. And I never know what to make of that or not. But it seems like oh, that's, that might be an intrinsic factor that plays into personal yeah. identity. I mean, um, I like I think that's more plausible if you're a physicalist um but you know if you're a dualist no like i think you've frequently had different parents right in oh, most yeah. of your lifetimes like, you know only in this lifetime well you know in most of your lifetimes you have different parents and, um, interesting yeah because if we're reincarnated then sure we yeah do i always right. is my soul um is is it uh do i have a nature like is it um is it like a bare particular that could could I have come back as a as a, a tiger or something like that, or do I necessarily do I have a human soul? Yeah, you know, good good question, right? I don't I don't know if you can be reincarnated as a non intelligent animal. Okay. Um, I think you you can be reincarnated as a member of a different species. Interesting. Like it could be a different intelligent species. I don't like know if it could or... be a non intelligent species, like yeah. with a completely different kind of mind. Okay. I have no way of knowing that because, you know, like I don't remember any of my previous lives or anything like that. I can't collect any evidence about this. Yeah. Um, but why do I say that it could be a non-human? Well, uh, you know, part of my claim is, you know, you've been reincarnated infinitely many times and will be infinitely many times in the future, but there are only finitely many humans ever, right? Like, you know, humans only started whatever, 200,000 years ago or 2 million years ago, depending on what you count or whatever. Yeah. And then, and we're, we only have a finite future also. Yeah. So, um, but you know, there might be, there might be a species that's extremely similar to humans that will exist on a different planet yeah. in the future. Uh, it just won't count as humans. Even if, even if it's so similar that it could interbreed with us, it won't count as the same species, but because it will have evolved separately. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, they're just not going to be interacting with the same stuff. I don't know. I don't want to get. I'm always yeah. tempted to go into like um, uh, semantic externalism or something like Twin Earth. Like they wouldn't. Twin Earth Parker is not really Parker, and they wouldn't be well, yeah. humans there. Yeah, if there's a Twin Earth, you know, the people on that are not really humans. Yeah. <laughs> even though they look exactly like us, <laughs> uh -huh. they could be they could be molecularly identical to humans. 
but they're not really humans because, you know, biologists individuate species according to their origin. Yeah. And, and you know, different taxonomic categories, right? Yeah. So, so some, some of like the neo Aristotelian folks are like, well, this is a reason why we shouldn't just go with, uh, historical origin when, when we're looking at biology, but we should look at like structure and, and stuff like that as well. And yeah. it freaks me out. I, I think I'm, it freaks me out because I think they're, they might be onto something. I think that that does sound like, oh, that, that, they make some good points, but I know like Darwinists kind of rule the day and they're like, no, dude, all we need is historical yeah. stuff. Well, Tree of life. Yeah, I mean, you know, like you can have a sort of a semantic debate about how you should individuate species. And yeah. like in my view, that doesn't matter metaphysically. So if you want to say it is the same species as long as it has the same, like, yeah. you know, universals, it has the same repeatable qualities, that's yeah. fine with me. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, all right. Let's, let's get into like what's the, what's the relation? of the soul to the body is, is the body, um, is the body necessarily ensouled like such that if, if, if it doesn't have a soul, it's not really a body. It's a, it's a corpse now. Do you, do you get into that mm. or does that not matter as much? So, I mean, I guess I would say no, uh, it's, it, um, it's not necessary. So like your body, I guess your body could be alive without your soul being in it. Right. So, you know, I, I, uh, I look this up. There's, you know, that, there's that condition anencephaly where yeah. uh, an infant is born without uh, a cerebral brain, right? cortex. Oh, okay. Cerebral right? cortex. Born without the important part of the brain, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and so that baby will have no consciousness and no ability to feel pain or have sensations. Uh, and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll typically die. They'll die within a few hours or days because you actually need a brain. Your body kind of needs a brain. Yeah. But, yeah. but it won't, it's not instantly dead, right? So it could be alive without the capacity for consciousness. Interesting. Do you, do you think, do you think that that body, um, that that child has a soul attached? Um, so just cause it doesn't have the important part of the brain means like, well, the, the body won't continue to survive, but perhaps it has a, a soul. What do, what do you, what do you think of that? I mean, I guess I would say no. Um, because what does it mean to have a soul? So like it's, you know, as far as I understand it, um, like it doesn't mean that the soul is like physically located in your body. Right. What it means, what it means for a body to be um, in soul <laughs> is there's a particular soul that has a certain causal connection to the body, such okay. that things that happen to this body cause mental states in this mind. Yeah. And things that this mind intends cause this body to do stuff. Yeah. And so there's no mind that bears that relation to the en encephalic baby. So it doesn't, it doesn't have a soul in the sense that anyone ever does. Okay. Yeah. That, that's interesting. So, uh, when it comes to like pairing, uh, the preexistent soul with, we haven't really gotten to your argument for, uh, why we think that, why we should think that we're like immortal. Um, and I want to get there, but what, uh, how, You've, I think you've already said, like, I don't know how the soul gets paired with the body. But yeah. do you have any, like, guess? Because it, it's, it's, it's poking at me. Like, how, especially given, like, a, a Darwinistic view of um, our origins, we're, okay, if we have a rational soul, uh, if, if I'm, like, uh, my nature is to have a rational soul, maybe I can be, yeah, uh, reincarnated in different rational animals. But prior to the rationality of humans, homo sapiens, like they wouldn't have rational souls. It seems like, right. In, in our evolutionary oh, wow. history before they moved from like the intentional with an S until they moved into that realm, like yeah, um, non-rational animals. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, like there's a distinction between the things that have minds and things that don't, and mm -hmm. the mind is a non-material thing. Yeah. Um, there's a like there's a qualitative difference between those mm -hmm. and there's only a quantitative difference between the rational and the non-rational right so okay. like okay you know, like all all the non-rational animals have experience well okay they don't all have experiences because clams are animals but anyway <laughs> all the ones that have brains i guess have experiences maybe 
Yeah. And maybe there's some brains that are too simple to have experiences. Okay, whatever. But um, <laughs> anyway, but all the ones that have experiences, they have souls in some sense. And there's not like, there's not like a qualitative change where suddenly you have a different kind of soul because you're intelligent. I don't think. Okay. Um, okay. So here's something that this, this brings up a really interesting point that, that a lot of people will bring against dualists and they'll say, it seems weird that um, a baby has the capacity to do calculus. Um, it's just their brain hasn't caught up to it yet. And I, I think kind of the same thing about our, our uh, you, given the Darwinistic evolution, that family, uh, you know, tree, it's like, yeah, um, the caveman or whatever had this ability to have podcast conversations with <laughs> philosophers, right? But it just, his brain wasn't caught up yet. What, what do you make of that uh, objection? Or and have you heard that before? Uh, I'm not sure if I have, but I'm not sure I see how, how this is an objection to something like. They, they, mean, they say it's weird. They say like, it, it's weird to think that like, okay, so the, the human soul like has the capacity humans have the capacity to uh do calculus and so if yeah. if if we all have souls then it seems like the unless you have a uh, progress of the soul unless the soul is changing then it yeah. seems like yeah you already had that capacity it's just you're like trapped cool. in this infant body who, who doesn't ha is not developed enough to actually use the capacities of their soul and that's a weird yeah. thing apparently uh, okay <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> um yeah, I mean, there's a weak sense in which cavemen could do calculus. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, like if a time traveler went back in time and grabbed a caveman and then brought him to a modern calculus class and then like, and raised him, because like they might have to be exposed to it when they're young or something. Like, yeah, to develop. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah, and then he would then he would do calculus. Like, you know, what's your problem? <laughs> like, um, um, I mean, yeah. it's weird if I I guess it's weird if you think that like. Um, that means that they were designed for calculus. No, they weren't, right? It's just like something that can happen. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I think this has to do with like, I, I think this will get into your uh, conception of like the, the brain and the soul, that the interaction there and what, what role the brain has. I think maybe um, based on the, the type of dualism that people have in mind, some people think, well, dualism just means that like the fully formed per Parker is already there present in the, the infant Parker and mm -hmm. you know, development of the brain doesn't really matter. It's just catching up to the soul's capacity or something like that. And it, oh, I don't yeah. think that's true. I think we develop and I think that, yeah, the interaction we, well, but yeah, go ahead. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the soul has um, the capacity to experience mental states, but what mental states you have depends upon um, the physical stuff. Right. Yeah. So like you're going to get more mental capacities if you get more brain capacity. And maybe if we like invent these, you know, um, implants where you attach a computer to your brain, then you'll get more mental capacities. Yeah. So like, you know, is that, does that mean that your soul had those capacities? I mean, only, only in the sense that your soul always has the capacity for anything that could happen. Yeah. Right? Um, but, you know, like the thing that's doing the work is mostly the brain. Mm -hmm. say so like something happens to your brain which causes mental states right and like your ability to do things like uh you know understand the fundamental theorem of calculus well you're lucky that you have a brain that's able to to get in the right state to cause you to have that state of understanding yeah you see what i mean yeah 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 and you do go yeah i mean you allow for or you you have interaction going on so to so then that mental state can cause your brain state to change such that you move your hand and write down the formula or something like that. So there is yeah. still interaction. Um, but do you, you, you put memories like wholly in the brain, right? Like you say that, um, when yeah. you die, the reason that I don't remember my past life is because each brain has encoded my memories. And so, right. okay. Yeah. And I mean, you're like, Oh, why do I think that? Because like, there's like, you know, medical evidence of this, right? Like people who get brain damage in certain places will just lose memories. Yeah. Well, um, okay. So I've heard some duelists and I don't, I don't know where I'm in, where I'm at with this, but some, some duelists will say like, um, think about like Tony Stark. Tony Stark is, uh, he becomes Iron Man when he puts on the suit and Iron yeah. Man is a, a composite of Tony Stark and this metal machine. And when his, uh, 
when his hand is when his the little booster thing on his hand uh is broken like iron man can't do that any longer um but like tony stark still has the ability to do that if he if he went into a different uh iron man suit and so yeah. people will use that with uh with memories and say well you just can't access the memories that you have because the physical capacity i think that's maybe a point for you though actually well yeah i mean so if he goes into a new suit then he'll have the capacities of whatever the new suit is. The new suit might not have the same capacity. Yeah. Right? So what will happen is you go into a new body and you know maybe maybe the new brain has different capacities and it doesn't have the same information in it. If somebody were to somehow reconfigure the neurons to like transfer the information, you know, like oh, maybe yeah. before you die, somebody scans your brain and like, you know, gets all of the information out of it. And yeah. then somehow they manage to put that into a new brain. Um, and you know, and they they pick the right brain that's going to have your soul in it. Yeah, right. <laughs> then you can keep your memories. However, this doesn't happen in the normal course of events. And then your brain is destroyed, and then nobody has the information. Yeah. Uh, what if? I wonder uh, about like like a transhumanist type view, where if you exchanged out over time uh, pieces of your brain for you could do you could do carbon or you could do silicon or something like that um if you did that over time could you create like a a body that doesn't die and then your soul like could you make yourself uh physically immortal oh yeah um uh, sort of i mean so <laughs> um there's no there's no plausible or you know I guess I should say there's no possible technological development that makes you literally immortal. Yeah. Because eventually we're going to reach the heat death of the universe. Oh, sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, and long before that, the sun will swallow up the earth and whatever. And like, we're not going to yeah. stop that from happening, even yeah. if you have a really great body. Um, <laughs> um, okay. But anyway, we could discover a cure for aging. Okay. Now, you know, part part of what you might be thinking is, well, maybe we could like replace brain parts with silicon chips and then aging doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And then like when the rest of the body dies, you can like take the silicon brain out and put it in a new body. Yeah. Like do you yeah, think you the soul would robot body? Would the soul um, follow that that silicon brain? Yeah, I don't know. So, you know, there's another great episode of Star Trek. <laughs> this is also Deep Space Nine, where you know they had a character named Vedic Burial. And mm -hmm. he's got some kind of brain disorder or something. So like they start putting, they put little silicon chips into his brain to help his brain function or something as they replace more of his brain with silicon chips. Okay. It's like his experience starts to fade. <laughs> he's like, yeah. Um, and then, and you know, there's a point at which uh, major Kira wants to keep substituting parts to keep him alive. And the doctor says, you know, it might look like Burial and it might talk like Burial, but it will not be Burial. <laughs> that's so good. I, that sounds like like uh, Chalmers or something, like Fading Qualia or something like that. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I don't know what would actually happen. So, yeah. Like, it's possible that that will happen, or it's possible that at one point it'll just shut off. Your quality right. will just shut off. It's also possible that they will shut off, but no one else will know <laughs> because yeah. the robot will, <laughs> will say, I have Qualia. <laughs> yeah. You just invented a philosophical <laughs> zombie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's also possible that, you know, you'll just continue. You'll just continue to have experiences and that'll be you. And like the main reason for thinking that that might be possible is that actually parts of your brain are replaced. They're not replaced by silicon, but yeah. you know, they're replaced by other carbon, carbon, whatever atoms yeah. in your brain get replaced by other atoms. Everything except that one particle that's truly me. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Maybe there's one particle that stays there. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so we're getting into this this other paper um uh existence of the soul uh, um i forgot the name uh, existence is yeah. evidence for immortality and and right. like the repeatability of persons which you also bring up in this paper too so um what this this all is kind of predicated on the uh infinity of the past and the future yeah and so yeah why why think that the past is infinite yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not I'm not certain that the past is infinite, right. but I do kind of so I regard the idea of the beginning of time a, a little bit like the way you would think of the edge of space. Mm -hmm. Now, so it's not contradictory 
Oh, yeah. right? I mean, in the sense that like you could describe a consistent mathematical structure that is a space with an edge, you know, like a sphere is a consistent mathematical object. Yeah. And so you can non-contradictorily say maybe space is a sphere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. But it just doesn't seem like that can be, you know, when you imagine like going to the edge of the sphere, it seems like you can still ask, and what is over there? Right. And point at it. <laughs> and like, you know, in the theory where space is limited, you would say there is no there, but it just seems like there is. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, in the theory where there's a beginning of time, say you appeared, you know, just at the beginning of time, it seems like you can ask, and what happened a minute ago? Right. And, you know, like the official answer is there wasn't a minute ago. There was no time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it is a malformed question, but it just does seem like that is a sensible question. And like, even if nothing was happening that you could say that. Okay. So now that's not super strong. So that, whatever the person who advocates the beginning of time will, will just go, oh, okay, whatever seems to you like there was a time <laughs> before or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, you know, like what, why would people think there was a beginning? Big, a beginning of time, like there is the Big Bang theory, right? Mm -hmm. So like traditionally, the reason why people thought there was a beginning of time was, you know, oh, it looks like the universe is expanding. And if you just sort of like retrodict it backwards, there's a point where everything was in one point. Right. And then how do you retrodict before that? So it looks like uh, everything must have started then. Yeah. Okay. And then so, you know, like the, the traditional Big Bang theory is yeah, the first thing that ever happened was there was an enormous amount of um, energy in a tiny point and it was moving outward. Yeah, that's the it was moving outward at the first instant that it existed. Yeah, for no reason. Right. And then everything else happened after that. And there was and what happened before that? Nothing, because there was no before. Right. Okay. Now, and to me, this is a super implausible theory. Yeah. Right. So in yeah. my my uh, objection to this is, well, I have a better theory, which is the 1950 theory. Mm -hmm. This is the theory that the world came into existence in the year 1950 and everything was just in the state that it was in. Every, you know, <laughs> this, the thing that you think was happening in 1950, all that was happening. But it's just that was the first moment of time. And mm -hmm. it was just like that for no reason. <laughs> and my claim is that is a better theory than the traditional Big Bang theory, because that is more probable. It's actually vastly more probable. Right? And why is that? Yeah. Um, okay. We know from the second law of thermodynamics, right? Entropy has increased drastically from the time of the Big Bang up until the year 1950. Mm -hmm. The fact that entropy is increasing actually means that that is a more probable state. Oh. So 1951 would be more probable than 1950, though. That's, that's right. Yeah. So okay. even better than the 1950 theory <laughs> is the 2022 theory. Right. The universe just appeared. Yeah. With us already in the podcast. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So this is, and, and this is meant to be like a reductio of the beginning of the, the universe. Yeah. Right. Like, okay. I mean, if you're going to say that stuff could just exist for no reason at the beginning of time yeah and then, then the 1950 theory is better okay right? um okay um so some someone will be tearing out their hair and saying like well what about the the problem of traversing an actual infinite you know if, yeah. if it, like how did we ever get to this point if there's an infinity backwards and i gotta admit like i like this one a lot and i'm i'm mm. i've heard people argue against it and usually it's kind of dizzying and i just forget it um, yeah. So then, then it's not a problem for me, but maybe you can remind me of, of like, <laughs> why this isn't a huge problem. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a confusing subject, the infinite. I have, I have a really good book to recommend. It's called Approaching Infinity mm -hmm. by one of my favorite philosophers. <laughs> and um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I basically think, well, no, there, there's no problem with actual infinities per se. There is a problem with some kinds of infinities, but, you know, the, the correct theory of the impossible infinite is not there can't be actual infinities or there can't be a completed infinity. The correct theory is there can't be um, an infinite natural intensive magnitude. Okay. And so, right. So the right distinction is not actual versus potential. It's intensive versus extensive magnitudes and also cardinal numbers versus magnitudes. So infinite cardinal numbers are fine and infinite extensive magnitudes are fine. Only the intensive magnitudes are a problem. 
and you know why should you think this? Um, basically, because um, this gives you a better a better way of solving the paradoxes. There's a whole bunch. Of, there's like 17 paradoxes of the right. infinite. Um, and I claim that you get better answers by prohibiting the intensive magnitudes. I also have a theory about why intensive magnitudes are different from extensive magnitudes. Okay. My, which is, you know, okay, this could, this could go off on a long tangent. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, look, you know, and then, and the theory that you can't complete an infinite series does not do very well because like, it doesn't do well with Zeno's paradox. Yeah. Um, and you know, like the problem is um, Zeno's paradox in a way is the opposite of some of the other paradoxes, right? Mm -hmm. In Zeno's paradox, the problem is that it seems like you can complete the series. Yeah. Um, and you know, the argument says that you can't, and so then you know that it would be impossible for anything to move. Yeah. Uh, in, in most of the paradoxes of the infinite, there's an infinite series, and you want to say intuitively that that series could not happen. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you just have a blanket view that, yeah, you can't complete infinite series, then you get you get rid of some of the other ones like Thompson's lamp and whatever. And the yeah, you would Ross paradox. But then you get Zeno, you get Zeno. Right? And then you have to say to and then you have to say something like, well, mathematics just doesn't uh, it doesn't apply to reality as as much as we thought. And so, yeah, maybe you can't. I forgot how people solve this. Um, Mark Sainsbury yeah. is going to be mad at me because we talked about this, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah i don't know i mean you know some people say oh maybe uh maybe space is really discrete and so there's not there's not really an infinite series right um, what aristotle said was okay yeah it's infinite but it's a potential infinity not an actual infinity oh yeah and you'd actuate it by actually cutting all the distances in half or something yeah i mean you know like well no why is that only potential like <laughs> you know which one of those steps did i not have to actually do right you actually do all the steps before getting to the end yeah. um aristotle's view appears to be uh it's not an actual division unless you stop if you go to the halfway point and you stop for at least some amount of time then you actually divided the motion yeah all right and if you did that then right then you act in fact could not get to the end yeah um now that's not even really true mathematically because you could stop for shorter and shorter periods each time oh yeah yeah, so yeah. That the sum could still be finite <laughs> so maybe you could get to the end but um but it's it actually would still be debatable whether that's possible right yeah right but anyway but the thing that i dispute is you know why do you have to stop like <laughs> I don't think that that's required for it to be actual. So you could you do the first half of the distance, and even though you don't stop when you get to the halfway point, it's still true that you did that right. halfway motion. Yeah, and then it's still true that you do the next halfway motion. It appears that his um, rationale is unless you stop at the halfway point, there's an overlap between the first stage and the second stage of the series. Yeah, there's a one point overlap, right? right. So to make them separate motions. <laughs> you have to have a point at which, you know, you're not moving so that, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I'm like, I, okay, I don't know. Like, well, what if I just say the first, the first motion is, you know, up to, but not including the halfway point. Right? Uh, yeah. Then the second motion is starting from the halfway point and going up to, but not including the three quarter mark. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, so like, so anyway, I don't, I don't think it's persuasive to say it's only a potential and not an actual infinity. Right. What, if someone says like, well, there's no such thing as like a, like mathematical points, uh, we can consider them in the abstract realm or, you know, in, in our minds, but they don't exist in reality. Just, yeah. just false. Or well, uh, so I don't know about points. So in that book, there's actually an argument against the existence of points. Okay. <laughs> which I call the zero argument. Some people like this argument. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know how much we should go into that. But anyway, okay. here, here's an argument, okay? To have zero of something is to not have any of that. Uh -huh. It's not to have a really small amount of it. It is to not have the thing. Yeah. Okay, now the volume of a spatial region is how much space it consists of, mm -hmm. or the volume of an object is how much space it takes up, okay? So uh, a measure, a thing with a volume of zero, a measure zero object is um, a thing that doesn't take up space. Or yeah. if it's sp supposed to be a region of space, it's a region of space that doesn't consist of any space. 
Mm -hmm. There cannot be a region of space that does not consist of any space. So right. there cannot be a measure zero region of space. Yeah. Right. Or zero volume. Okay. A point is a zero volume region of space. So mm -hmm. it can't be a point. Yeah, that's good. This is I like that. It seems now we kind of have humor versus humor though. Yeah, uh, like uh, no yeah. no points and then Zeno, but yeah, yeah we, so we, we you, you can still you can get the infinite series without having points. Right? Okay, okay. Because there's the individual each motion is a finite motion. Okay. In the original series. Okay. Each halfway motion. Yeah. I mean, it's an extended motion. Okay. I need to read this book. I need to get approaching the infinity by whoever that that famous. Uh, I, I know it's handsome, a really good book. Handsome author is. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm gonna do that. So, bringing us back, um, you have this. You have a probabilistic, probabilistic uh, proof of reincarnation, and anyone who knows your work, uh, no surprise that the the Bayes machine goes brrr, yeah, like yeah. here we go. Um, are you able to lay this out for us in a podcast, or is this something they're just going to have to look at the the paper? Yeah, I mean, well, let me let me say the sort of intuitive idea. I say the intuitive idea, but it might be counterintuitive. Yeah. But anyway, you know, there are two hypotheses. One is that people could be reincarnated and, you know, call this the reincarnation theory and the annihilation theory. And the annihilation theory is, you know, once you've lived and died, it's impossible for you to ever exist again. Mm -hmm. The reincarnation theory is, no, you could exist again if the right conditions obtain. Okay. And now, um, assuming that time is infinite in both directions, or in particular, it's infinite in the past, on the annihilation theory, you should not be here now. Yeah. That is the probability of you being here now is zero, right? Because you should have either been here before now, which would have prevented you from being here now, or you should never exist. Yeah. So like if the conditions for you, suppose there are some conditions for you to be born for the first time, assuming that you haven't existed previously, those conditions either have zero probability or non-zero probability. If they have zero probability, then you should, you, then you're never born ever right. in all of time, even in an infinite time, because, you know, if you integrate zero over, you know, the integral of zero from negative <laughs> infinity to positive infinity is zero. Yeah. So there's no, there's zero probability of your ever being born. If it's a non-zero probability, then it should have happened before now mm -hmm. with, you know, probability one, which means yeah. that you shouldn't be here now. You'd already exist. Yeah. So the fact that you're here now refutes the annihilation theory. Yeah. And then supports the reincarnation theory. And then given that people can be reincarnated, anything that is a non zero probability will happen given infinite time. So after so you die, there's an infinite time after that. So eventually it will happen, what, whatever the conditions are. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, um, I was thinking if there's, what if there's a, a third answer, like um, beginning but no end theory? Um, so if, I guess it would depend on the future being infinite as well. But if, if I was born at a time in 1950 or something, then I would exist for, I don't know how to even talk about this, but like half of infinity or something. Like the infinity yeah, yeah. that I would exist for would be a smaller infinity than had I existed the whole time, but it's still an infinity. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just a smaller infinity. Is yeah, that like, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the main way that I can think that I would be wrong is if there actually is a beginning of time in spite of what I said. Yeah. So if there is a beginning of time, then the argument collapses. And okay. Actually, and not only the, the part about you having infinitely many past lives, but the, the part about you having future lives also collapses. Okay. Right. Because, you know, the annihilation theory could be true then. Right. So if there was a beginning of time, it could be that you know, there's a chance of you coming into existence and like, you know, it took 14 billion years for it to happen. And yeah. now that has happened, then it never happens again. Uh -huh. And right. So then like, there's no argument for that being improbable. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say, um, let's say there's a beginning of time, but no end of time. Um, on that theory, if I had, a, if I had a beginning, but no end, would that be, would that still be a better theory than um, the annihilation view that I, came into being for 80 years and then passed out of existence? Um, well, I mean, would it, would it be better in some way that we haven't mentioned? I don't know. <laughs> right. Cause yeah. right. Like the, I mean, the argument, you know, like the Bayesian argument just requires the, the infinite past in order to get okay. the probabilities. Um, you know, what, like what happens is, um, you know, you, as long as there's a non-zero probability of reincarnation, 
and there's a non-zero probability of your being here now, if there's a reincarnation, then you yeah. get probability one. Okay. For reincarnation. <laughs> Which is pretty high. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty high. But uh, but if you you know, you need the zero probability, the zero probability that you would be here now if people could only live once and all the time. Okay. If you don't have that zero, then you need you actually need the numbers for the other probabilities. Yeah. Right? Oh, okay. If you have yeah. the zero, then you don't need the numbers for the other gotcha. probabilities. And those numbers <laughs> might be hard to come by. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Golly, that's such a fascinating. So then in order to get out of this, like the annihilationist would would need to say, well, I'm, they'd need to argue against the infinity of the past, right? Right, yeah. Okay. I think, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, or maybe I made some other mistake that I didn't think of, right? But, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you you note that um, this argument doesn't presuppose souls. Like, we, we've talked about souls this whole time, but then you say, look, it doesn't presuppose souls, just that you exist, whatever the case. Yeah. And then souls are just further evidence for this reincarnation. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, you, know, you might think, oh, reincarnation requires a soul. And so that's not strictly true. Yeah. Right? So like logically speaking, you could be a physicalist who believes in reincarnation. Sure. This is a this would be an odd view, but this is possible, right? Because you could think, oh yeah, you know, okay, so we're space-time worms, mm -hmm. which is what which is like a common view of personal identity, especially if you're a physicalist. Uh -huh. Um you might think, and also it could be a gappy space-time worm. So part of it's here, and then there's another part of the worm up here. And so especially on. if time travel is possible. Yeah. If you're a four, oh, yeah, four dimensional yeah, block, yeah. then yeah, your your worms could be your segments could be all over the place. Yeah, I mean, like that would be maybe another another way to have it be gappy, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, like you could be a physicalist and you could think, well, like maybe the conditions for personal identity just make it so that this later space time worm that's going to exist a billion years from now counts as part of the same whole worm as the one here now. Yeah. Right. And I don't know, you know. Okay, but anyway, if you know, you might think that's sort of implausible. So yeah. you might think that maybe reincarnation at least supports the soul or something. Yeah. Um, okay. But if that's the case, that just means that my argument for reincarnation is a further argument for the soul. Right. Yeah. It doesn't presuppose the soul. Right. As you know, like just, just go back to the original argument. Suppose you think, you know, um, you think people are just physical objects and physical objects can't recur. I suppose you think that. And I go, okay. Yeah. And how certain are you of that? And as long as you don't say a hundred percent, the argument is just going to go through, right? Yeah. And I go, okay. So then, well, the probability of you being here now, if that's true, um, is still going to be zero. Yeah. Oh man. So it's just going to disconfirm the physicalist theory, right? Right. Right. Um, yeah, that's good. So what do you make? What if, physicalists hearing this who are super triggered and they're like, man, this is really anti-scientific. Yeah. Um, uh, would, do you just go in for like a bang crunch uh, universe that, you know, maybe it's the universe like an accordion and it's been good doing that forever. Um, maybe it's, it's super mysterious, right? Like it's um, many people don't realize, you know, entropy mm -hmm. is very bizarre. It's bizarre how it started out. The universe started out in an incredibly ridiculously low entropy state. Right. You know, which according to Roger Penrose has a probability of one in 10 to the 10 to the 124 of, you yeah. know, like if you pick a random state of the universe, the, yeah. what we think was actually the Big Bang state, you know, you have a one in 10 to the 10 to the 124 chance of picking that state. Anyway, so um, it's super bizarre that it started out that way and then it's going towards more and more entropy. And then you think what's going to happen in the future? Like, so maybe maybe it goes to the heat death of the universe. Maybe there's some process that we don't know about that reverses entropy. Oh yeah. And it's been doing that for the whole time. And like, uh, you know, like maybe sometime after you get to a really high entropy state, somehow it gets reversed, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, the, the other possibility is um, the multiverse. So, you know, we're going for more bizarre. <laughs> I've already given you some bizarre ideas, but anyway, let's get more bizarre. Yeah, let's do Maybe it. There's a multiverse. So, and I, because I got this from um, um, the cosmic landscape, you know, Leonard Susskind, that uh, maybe new universes are appearing periodically. Mm -hmm. right? There's like, maybe there's an extremely large space time and it's just constantly expanding. Yeah. And periodically, a new universe appears in in the new space time that expands uh -huh. and we don't we, didn't, we never see this happen because they're really far away 
Okay. They're so far away that we can never see them. Okay. But anyway, periodically that happens. And then in that universe over a very long period of time runs down. It starts out in this initial um, low entropy big bang state, and then it moves towards thermal equilibrium and then just stays there for a ridiculously long time. Yeah. But new universes appear <laughs> periodically. And so like that could be how we're not in thermal equilibrium right now. Okay. Right. And then, you know, when you get reincarnated, then you'll be reincarnated in a new universe. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is partly to explain why you're not a Boltzmann brain. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because if there's only one universe, it should go to thermal equilibrium. And then after that time, you know, most agents should be Boltzmann brains. Yeah. I was just thinking Boltzmann brain. So that's funny that you were, maybe we are thinking the same thoughts here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's, yeah, that's really good. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, con continuing on with the paper, um, you, I wanted to bring this up cause you say people always ask you, uh, if we can be reincarnated at different times, then why not different spaces? And, um, you kind of just, we're talking about that. You maybe different, different universes. If there are, uh, if there is a multiverse, um, is that the answer? I, it seemed like you had a different one in the, in the paper. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so when people ask me this, I think that, um, what they have in mind is, you know, maybe I am in different places right now. Oh, okay. Okay. And, okay, and I want to say, well, uh, I mean, I know by introspection that I'm only living one life. And so like, I, I can know by direct observation, direct introspective observation that I'm not in a different place unless the different place looks exactly like this. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I assume that that's not the case because there's some stuff that is random. And so periodically there would be a divergence, even if like everything was the same up till now, some random thing should happen so that, you know, these two places that I'm in would diverge from each other. And then I should see different things happening. I should see like two incompatible scenes. Yeah. Over the same time. Right. And that never happens. So I feel like I can know that I'm not in another place. Um, but I don't have anything like that evidence that I'm not in another time. Yeah. Because like me being in another time means I will be in this other time in the future, but I wouldn't know that now. I wouldn't experience anything now. Right. If it's true that in the future, I'm going to be there. Yeah. So, um, so that brings up another point that, that you say, um, so we already talked about how you lose your memories because you don't have this brain any longer, but you also say that, uh, in like the uh, intermediate state or whatever, to use some theological language for you, uh, people are are unconscious. And I wonder, like, why why think that the the immaterial soul is unconscious without um, without its body? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could say, oh, you know, maybe your soul gets destroyed when when you die, mm -hmm. and then maybe it gets recreated um, later. And you're like, well, I don't know. Is that better than the view that it just exists in an unconscious state in the interim? Yeah. Um, but, you know, so like, here's a thing that I think is analogous. Like you go to sleep and let's say you have a dreamless sleep. So you have no conscious experiences and then you wake up. So here are two views that you could have. Like maybe you stopped existing or, you know, maybe your mind stopped existing yeah. and it came back into existence when you woke up or maybe it existed in an unconscious state. Yeah. While you were asleep. I mean, I don't know why, but the second one sounds like the right yeah. answer. What uh, I think, again, De you know, Descartes was wrong on some stuff, but I think Descartes was saying, I think he said that you are conscious when you uh, are asleep, but you don't remember it or something like that. And could, could that be the case since, since on your theory, uh, the memories are stored in, in the brain. And so if we were conscious without the brain, and then we come back into consciousness in our physical body, those memories wouldn't be encoded in, in our physical hardware. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so in in fact, people forget most of their dreams, right? Right. So, you know, like one thing that happens is uh, you could wake somebody up in the middle of the night and they'd be having a dream. And then if if they immediately tell you what the dream is, then they will remember it. Yeah. But, like, but if they don't, then they will forget it. Uh -huh. All right, because it's sort of like your memory your memory recording mechanism is disconnected while you're asleep. So you don't remember the dream or something, yeah. but you only have short term memory. So like you've got a few seconds of memory there. And so if you go over what happened in the dream, as soon as you wake up, then it gets added to your memory. Yeah. But anyway, okay. But um, I don't think 
I don't think anyone, any of these sleep researchers thinks that you're always dreaming in your sleep, right? Like there are some periods when you're dreaming and other periods when you're not. And I don't know exactly how you know that. Maybe it's because you wake people up sometimes annoyingly. <laughs> and <laughs> hey, were you dreaming? They, they weren't, you know, they say they weren't having any dream or something. And then other times they were. Maybe it also has to do with brain scans or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But anyway, um, yeah, so, you know, there's there's that case. And then you might think, oh, well, but um, maybe you you count as still existing because you still had a brain that had the capacity for generating experiences, even though it was offline. Yeah. Right. Um, um, and then, you know, like, but then when you die, maybe then you stop existing. Okay. So then I had this, you know, hypothetical where, like, imagine that somebody dies in the normal sense. Um, so like their heart stops beating and their brain waves cease. So they would be declared dead under standard criteria. Um, but we have some amazing medical technology that can reanimate a body. I don't know any reason why this is not physically possible. So, yeah. okay, so you're dead for an hour. So definitely counts as dead on standard criteria. Uh -huh. But, you know, then like these um, amazingly advanced doctors show up and say, actually, we have this, we'd like to try out this revival technology. <laughs> and so then they reanimate you. And then you go back to your normal life after that. So yeah. then we want to say, during the period that you were dead, you existed, right? <laughs> Maybe. So like, yeah, I, I would want to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of like being asleep, right? Yeah. What, what do you make of, um, of like NDE, like uh, near death experiences um, where people say like, yeah, I look down on the operating table or something like that. Is that just, um, that's just like our, uh, a trick that our mind is playing on us? Or do you think that's actually uh, some of those yeah, could be plausible? I mean, I assume it's probably like they're dreaming or hallucinating. Okay. Uh, now, what would convince me otherwise would be um, if, you know, in a controlled experiment, the person was able to provide information. Right. That they wouldn't have known that, otherwise. Yeah, that, that couldn't have been communicated to them otherwise than by them seeing it. If they saw a note card on top of the operating table up top. Or yeah, like, like that, you know, but... there's like a light on the operating table, right? On the far side of the light, they could put some information and then yeah. you see it. They should do that in all the operating rooms. Like, yeah. they should put a, I don't know, something. They should put a sticker for Parker's Pensies. Uh, that, yeah. that would be Yeah, and, you know, like it's got to be something weird like Parker's Pensies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that a person wouldn't guess, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if somebody has tried to do this. They better. They should try it. Yeah, that would be really cool. That'd be a really good experiment. Yeah. Um, Something weird. Okay. Um, okay. So then we're, we're just oh, a, yeah. a, couple, a couple more uh, here. I'm going to finish out with, um, and it's just like, uh, someone might be saying, well, this diminishes uh, the sting of death. And so, you know, who cares if I'm a murderer or whatever, because you're just going to live again an infinite <laughs> number of times. Yeah. Like, what do you make of that? Does this yeah, destroy I mean, ethics? Well, I mean, I did think that, you know, the ethical implications are interesting. So, um, you know, your future is infinite either way. Like, no matter what happens, you have an infinite future. And, like, um, the value of your future is infinity or perhaps negative infinity. I don't know. <laughs> like, it's either positive or negative infinity, but it, the total is not going to be changed by any finite event that happens in this life. So then you might think, oh, so it doesn't matter. Okay, but then, but maybe you know maybe that means that the correct ethical concern isn't about the total. Maybe the the correct like even just the correct consequentialist concern is about the part that you can affect. Yeah. Right? So some if somebody does something mean to you, and it will the part that they could affect got worse. The total didn't get worse because it was infinity. Right. Right. But right. The part that they could affect got worse. So then that's why we it would be wrong. Um, but then you think like, um, you know, is it bad to die now, given that, you know, you'll just like wake up in another body. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there will be a time when you're unconscious. Yeah. Right? So one thought is, yeah, it's bad because like there was this time when you were going to be conscious and presumably having overall positive experiences during which instead you're unconscious. Yeah. So, you know, you lost that. That, that was bad. Yeah, According, you might say alternatively, no, no, it doesn't matter because like all that matters is what's happening in subjective time. In your subjective time, you didn't lose any. Oh, yeah, sure. Right? 
sure. <laughs> in objective time, you lost a certain amount, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it would be, it'd be a different case if you like tortured someone to death versus like silently poisoned them or snuffed them out in their sleep or something. Cause then they would, their subjective experience would be way worse than if they just kind of poofed out and didn't know. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Di dying painlessly is better than dying painfully. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> we, that's we can true. agree on that. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the only uh, non controversial things that we've said today. Yeah. Which is good. Um, okay. And that, and that's, uh, I appreciate it. You, you, you mentioned uh, Epicurus and his argument there where it's like, you know, who cares if I die, I'm going to be dead. But you're like, no, there, there's, <laughs> there's reasons to care whether we're uh, conscious and alive or not. Oh, also um, posthumous harm. I thought was interesting. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the case you used, but it was like, you know, diminishing someone's works after they're, yeah. after they're dead. Can you, do you, can you recall that for us? Yeah. I mean, um, Jason Brennan suggested this on Facebook actually that, you know, I think it was him, you know, GWF Hegel is such a terrible writer. We should punish him by not reading his books anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then he'll be, he'll be forgotten, which is what he deserves. Yeah. So we should do that. Um, and so that kind of makes it seem like you can harm Hegel, even though he's dead. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's a funny remark also, and it's funny partly because he's dead, right? Yeah. Like if he was alive and you said that, it wouldn't be as funny. No. Um, but also there, so there's sort of like two intuitions there, I think. There's sort of an intuition that, yeah, we would be, would be punishing him, but there's also an intuition that there's something funny about considering that as a punishment right so uh, anyway like you know there's a bunch of philosophical arguments that depend on the idea that you, at certain times you don't exist mm -hmm. so you know epicurus's argument or at least one interpretation of this is uh well death can't be a harm because you don't exist at the time that you're dead and it's impossible for a non-existent thing to be harmed or benefited mm -hmm. you know non-existent things don't have any properties so it can't be harm. Right. And then, you know, like there's the argument against posthumous harm. Like, um, you know, you can't be harming Hegel by not reading his books because he doesn't exist. And like, there has to be a thing in order for there to be a harm. There has to be a right. sufferer of the harm. So even if he's unconscious, he's got to at least exist. Right. So anyway, like, you know, my, my view about persons um, just uh, gets rid of all of these arguments. Right. And so because they do exist, they're just unconscious. Right. Yeah. Hegel exists. You know, he's just unconscious. Actually, he might he might be conscious because he might be in another lifetime now. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, he's he's experiencing uh, the full uh, synthesis antith antithesis right now in a different universe, maybe even. Yeah, maybe. Well, maybe he's right now being tortured by having to read his own works. <laughs> that would be fitting. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, oh man, we've covered so much stuff here. This has been fantastic, Dr. Humor. Thanks so much for, for coming back on. Yeah. Uh, if someone, okay, so we got some homework too, like approaching the affinity. That's a good one. Uh, skepticism. Uh, uh, I forgot what that one's called. Uh, the veil of skepticism. What's the full name of that? Yeah. Skepticism and veil of perception. There we go. That's yeah, it. Yeah. yeah that's positive. another one. Um, you got so much good stuff. And, and when I think of like a, a, a philosopher, um, I think of you, I think of, a philosopher should be able to talk about all this kind of stuff should have thoughts on political philosophy. Of course, like something, um, uh, something I read from Scruton once and, and, and he was like, all the, there's a lot of modern philosophers who have no political views or not, not well reasoned ones. And that's a tragedy. And so I, I'm just so grateful for, for you filling the role of a philosopher today and giving a, us, uh, kind of like, Hey, that's what a philosopher is. Let's aim at that. Um, if someone wanted to discover more of your work, uh, where, where can they find you at? Oh, yeah. So um, I know I like I have a web page, yeah. owl232.net, O-W-L-232.net. And I have a blog, fake noose. That one's so good. F-A-K-E-N-O-U-S dot net. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, buy all my books on Amazon. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you also have a, a YouTube channel. That's you, right? Uh, I, do, I do have a YouTube channel. Yeah, I uploaded some lectures that I had um, recorded for students during the pandemic, right? Yeah. So, you know, like right after classes went online, I started recording lectures. And then after that, after the class was over, I uploaded them. So that's okay. good. I'm, uh, I've am i done like, you know, a bunch of podcasts and things like this 
but you know, even with other people, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's so sad. <laughs> I saw you did like a five hour one once that was pretty wild. Yeah. And so, um, there's a bunch of things on YouTube. I should, yeah. I should like collect them all in one place. That yeah. People could find it. Yeah. That'd be huge. Well, awesome. Um, he's all over the place. He's ubiquitous. Um, you can find him all, all around and, uh, he might be living forever. So you'll be able to find him <laughs> centuries from now as well. Um, that's going to have to do it for now, folks. Again, if you like this podcast, uh, episode, give it a like, give it a share, give us a comment. And, uh, you can find us also in Parker's Pensy's Ponceurs, Ponceurs in, uh, on Facebook. So, uh, don't spam up the group and I'll let you in. That'd be great. Check out my sponsors, become a patron, all that good stuff. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies and as always all glory to God.